this morning a sense of expectancy. That God, the Bible says that the Spirit landed on each person who was in the room. That God is able to transact on behalf of every person who is in this, in this house today. There is such a man here in John chapter 5. It says that there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a pool at the sheep gate at Jerusalem, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of people who were sick, who were blind, who were lame, who were withered, waiting for the moving of the water, for the move of the Spirit. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and troubled the water. And whoever was first in after the troubling of the water was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying and knowing that he had spent much time, he said to him, Do you desire to be made whole? The infirm man answered and said, Sir, when the water is troubled, I have no one to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise up, take your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And it was a Sabbath day. Therefore the Jews said to him who had been healed, It's the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to take up the bed. And he answered them and said, The man who made me whole said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him and said, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? And he did not know him who had cured him. For Jesus had moved away, a crowd being in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come to you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. Father, we seek such a transaction today with you. That we would be made whole. And that we would be healed of Jesus. We thank you for this service. And we commit it into your hands. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you worshipers. God bless you. We need to, as we have a walk with God, we need to pump up our faith. We need to believe God, as I said this morning, that the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Lord of our soul, is able to do something for us. That's been pending for a very long time. The Bible is talking here about a man that is seen by Jesus amongst many others. God is well able when it is due season, when the time has come. With the Lord Jesus, no matter how long it has been, no matter how much it has resisted intervention with the Lord Jesus, when the time comes, he says, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Because in due course, when the time is right, 
you will reap a reward if you faint not. In the Bible, we have a lady that had waited to have a baby for nearly 70 years. That was Sarah. We have Hannah who was married and the younger wife of her husband had had several babies before her, though she was the beloved one. We have a woman that was walking around with a, a hemorrhagic condition in her uterus that had been 12 years. There's another one who was bent double with a condition of her spine for 18 years. But there came a day when it was the right time. There came a day when the Jew season of God had happened. And when the Jew season of God comes, it doesn't matter that they are putting one person at a time only. God can circumvent that because he's not governed by the laws of nature. He's not governed by the laws of men. And so Jesus comes to this man and he says to him, Guys, you'll have to get me the right time or we'll be here the whole day. And he says to them, and he says to this man, I, do you desire to be made well? Do you have a desire? You find in Jesus' ministry, God will not give you something that you don't earnestly desire. Because it's of no value to you. God won't just cast pearls before swines. That's why he said, crave pure spiritual milk. Crave the things of God. Whatsoever you desire, you have to heartily want something. Because if you go and ask certain people, I'm sure there are people who are disabled, but because they are on some welfare program, if help was offered them to be healed, they would say no because they want the check. There are some people in our families who enjoy being pitied on. That like the hand-me-down clothes that are subsidized whenever there's a contribution to make. But they enjoy that. But Jesus is saying, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to become independent? Do you want to start walking a path where my purpose for your life, because there is no one without a destiny in God, and your destiny is not to be a perpetual dependent. So he says, do you want to be made whole? Just to check. He said to the blind man, he says, what will you have me do for you? Because he wants to know. There are certain blind people that just want bread. They just want something at the traffic lights. But Jesus says, what, what, what do you want? There are also people who, when they are blessed by God, they will not testify that they've been blessed by God. Oh, my grandmother was an excellent. She would have so much money. This Mzukuru, this child would give her money. And if you said, Gogo, go, please, can I? Oh, I don't have money. And then if you meant explain to her that your situation was desperate, then she'd be like, I have got some money for my club that I might just lend you maybe my club. It was her money. <laughs> it was her money. But she didn't want people to know that. So if God really wants to bless you, let's forget about bank balances. Let's forget about credit cards. Imagine that we were in the old days of sheep and donkeys and cows and chickens. And God wanted to bless you with flocks and herds. How would you hide it? How would you? I'm not saying flaunt your wealth. But please, if God has blessed you, you're blessed. Don't keep saying, oh, under the circumstances of Zimbabwe, under the economy of Zimbabwe. Just say, you know what? God has been gracious. So he says, would you be made whole? Damn guy. Listen to him. He says, oh, would you be made whole? I, when the moment comes that the, there's no one just a victim mentality. For 38 years as a man, you cannot be resourceful enough 
to get someone to bring you 28 centimeters into a pool for 38 years. What kind of a guy? Come on. The hallmark of a man is to be resourceful. The hallmark, young men, of a man is to be resourceful. Your wife, you should pray for accommodation. You should pray for transport. You should pray for food. A man must just make a plan. You can pray, but your wife should be taken care of. God will help you if you hear what I'm saying and if you have the faith. 38 years, I said in the first service, firstly, this guy was not in a cell group. I can tell you that. The youth have got to go down. Uh Uh-oh. Guys, you've got another service downstairs. I want to pray for these guys before they go down. And I want to pray for those that are writing examinations. um, Because we're starting a new term now, grade 7, form 4. And we want to believe God that it's due season for our children. That all of them in the remaining days will come back successful in the exams. If you have a child who's going back to school, please stand. If you're going back to school yourself, please stand. And the, and the, and the bridge, if you would stand, we're going to pray for you. No, no, if you have a child as well, if you're not a child. Father, raise your hand to God. Father, we're asking for a special grace for academic victory for the families that are represented here, that those that are going back to school would be blessed by you, and Father, that they would excel in what they do, that each one of them would be able to pass to the next stage because of this prayer that we make now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Bridges, you could... uh, Bridges, you can make your way if you, if you must. But I was saying that this, this, uh, Pastor Jimbetete, this guy was not in a cell group. Because if you're in a cell group for 38 years, surely someone is going to take you to, this guy kept no touch with his family. He didn't respond on the WhatsApp groups. He, 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 he didn't, he, he didn't involve himself in anything. Because otherwise, his brother's children would have come and put him in the water. So he answers very dumbly. He says, I have no one to put me into the water. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to show you something now. Rise up and walk. He gets up and he walks. What does he do when he walks? He disappears. He doesn't even come to say thank you to Jesus like the leper. The people are asking him, are you not the guy who was? And you know, this guy had a condition of his doing. Because at the end, Jesus says, go and sin no more. Otherwise, something worse will happen to you. He was up to something, this guy. He was stealing at someone's house. And he jumped out of the third floor and landed on his back, broke his back. That's why his legs were paralyzed. So Jesus says to him, go and sin no more. Otherwise, something worse will happen to you. I'm bringing a word to someone today that so great is God's mercy. So great is Jesus' grace that even when you have dug a hole for yourself, he's able to extricate you when it's the right time. So he heals the guy. Everybody's on about the Sabbath. Oh, why did you do? I love Jesus. Most of his healings were on the Sabbath day. So that we don't get religious. That we don't get legalistic about the Sabbath. Sabbath is a design of God that we would get rest imitating what he did. And prophesying eventually when we shall get into a permanent rest with him. One of these days, we're going to talk about sleep. God wants, sleep is when you repair. None of the, seven hours a man must find to sleep. But we'll talk about it another time. 
today is not the day. But Sabbath, you, you, if you do good, don't be... He says, let no one judge you about moons and so on and about the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is for men, not men for the Sabbath. And Jesus said, you guys, every single one of you, when it's a Sunday or whatever you believe the Sabbath is, Saturday, you know, the Jews were, were completely crazy about this. What Moses had not said, they had now put into their 613 laws. If you had a false tooth because it weighed more than six grams, you had to take it off on the Sabbath because it's heavy. You're doing work, yes. If you had an artificial leg, you had to take it off on the Sabbath because you're doing work, you're carrying a load. Burdening themselves. Yes, go to Jerusalem today. There are sub Shabbat elevators that stop at every floor so that you don't press the buttons because it's work to press the button of the elevator. Yes, there are instant coffee dispensers that you just stand and it, and it makes coffee so that you are not pressing and grinding beans. It's work. And Jesus said, I'm going to heal you on the Sabbath so that people, my people who are set free, understand the whole purpose of keeping the Sabbath and making, oh, you must keep the Sabbath, but there's a way that you do it, and God describes it. Isaiah 58 in many places. But I want us to go back to this man. Not every, no matter how long the situation has been, God is able to deal with it. I want you to write down things that have chronically resisted intervention in your life. Right to. Think of Sarah, think of Hannah, think of Rebecca, who was at primary infertility. That lady who had dysfunctional uterine bleeding for so long. Think about those people. But no matter how long it has been, God is able to reverse it. We are talking here about the third miracle in the book of John. The first miracle, you remember it, was the wedding at Cana and turning water into wine. The second was the nobleman's son that was healed. And he was healed by remote control. He was at home. Jesus was with the father. And Jesus said, go, your son is well. And by the time he got home, found out the son was well. And we say, the first miracle must happen in each one of our lives. Each one of us must bring six jars to God. Jars that must be filled by God with what that you fill with water. Bring what useless stuff that is in there and let God touch it and turn it into choice wine. Your health. Guys, mental illness is on the rampage. Do you understand? Neurological disease and, and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. These things have gone on the ramp. We never used to hear about them. And we have an opportunity to bring our jars to Jesus and say, Jesus, here is what might happen to me. But I'm asking you to change it. Your character and your legacy. That the end of your life is greater than the beginning. Now, not every sickness is as a result of a person's sin. Do not judge families that are going through stuff and say, they opened the door to the devil. It was their father's fault. You know, only God knows. There are some people for sure that are in trouble because of sin. But there's some people that Jesus said, don't think that this guy is blind because of what his parents have done or even what he has done. This is just to magnify God. And so, Christian, when you are in a distressing situation, ask God to manifest the purpose for your distress so that he may be magnified. And God will definitely let the glory shine through you. There is no one that God hates. There is no one that God loves more than another. 
And so if you are in a situation, and let us stop this business of judging one another when they're going through difficult situations, because not every sin, not everything that you see is as a result of sin. Now, this guy here, notice, and I want you to put yourself in his shoes. Notice that the guy wasn't looking for help from Jesus. Zero. The guy had no faith in Jesus. The guy had never heard of Jesus. And he was just sitting there. But Jesus saw him. And he said, looking at him that he had been in the condition for a long time, he walked up to him. There was the blind, there was the lame, there was the cripple, but it was this guy's time. Pray to God that firstly you don't miss it when it is your time, but that God just makes your time. Pray to God. And Jesus comes and heals the guy. Now, the title of our message is Go and Sin No More. Go and Sin No More. When it comes to... Who's pulling me this side? I have to keep a, a good testimony. Pastor Shimbeto, that was excellent last week. 28 minutes and you delivered such a powerful service. 28 minutes. We need that uh, anointing <laughs> in the ministry. I listened to it. I was exercising for an hour and I had the headphones. At 28 minutes, cool. Another word? What? What? Gone. It finished. But God is wanting to process us correctly. Now, when it comes to healing, there are people who are healed by God, like this guy, who, who wasn't expecting it, who didn't meet the usual criteria for healing. Are you hearing me? There are things that God is going to sort out in your life that don't meet the usual criteria for being resolved. But when they have been resolved, repent and sin no more. Because Jesus said in Mark 7 about the conditions for Christians healing. He said, I'm not going to respond to you Syrophoenician woman because it is for the Jews. This healing thing is a package for, for, for Jews. And the woman said, firstly, I'm not a Jew, I understand that. Secondly, I know that you have all power. Thirdly, I know a time is coming where Gentiles are going to be in included in this salvation. So just drop a crumb. And that crumb is going to be enough for my daughter. And Jesus said, I have not seen such faith. He marveled at her faith. Christians need to understand that healing of hypertension and diabetes and cancer and according to God is bread for the children. The lady that was, you know, all these conditions are in the Bible. Osteoporosis, uh, epilepsy. We just give them fancy names, but if you go and look, abscesses, everything was in the Bible. Hemiplegia, para, oh, everything was in there. And this woman was bent like this. It says that she, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 10, I think it says she, she couldn't stand up straight. And Jesus saw her and saw that it had been 18 years. And he said, woman, Thou art loosed. And again, those guys went berserk. How does he do it? And, it's a, and Jesus is trying to show them that the Sabbath does not preclude you from doing what is right. And he says, woman, thou art loosed. And they said, how could you do this? He says, this daughter of Abraham, whom the devil has kept bound for 18 years, is it not appropriate? He says, what about you? You take your cows and take them to the water on the Sabbath. And yet you untie them to go. But you don't want God to untie this one to be loosed. And healing 
with us is, dele is by delegated authority. We shouldn't be afraid to command people to be healed in Jesus' name because you are not the one that is healing. You understand? If I send you, if I was the president, and I send you to go and do something, if I tell you, go and bring the CEO of such, such a company, you don't go and say, excuse me, Mr. CEO, when you have time, when it's appropriate, when it fits you, I have a message that I would like to uh, gently apply. If, you know, you just say, hey, comrade, you need to come with me right now. Because I am under delegated authority. And Jesus said, I'm sending them out two by two. I said, wherever you go, heal the sick, raise the dead by delegated authority in the name of Jesus. So I want us to go and become practitioners of this. The Bible says that he couldn't do many miracles in Capernaum because of their unbelief. He says he marveled at their unbelief. And he says immediately he went on a circuit teaching. The antidote to, to inadequate faith for healing is poor doctrine and poor understanding of what God has said about you. You have to come to God and actually talk to the Lord and say why I must be healed. If you have a condition as a Christian now, I told you that God has grace sometimes and he'll heal a non-believer. He'll heal him. But there's a reason. You'll see what happened, why he would do that. But for you and me, you have to tell God why. Say, God, I see. Firstly, you said that, be, 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 beloved, I wish that you would be in health and prosper, even as your soul prospers. And the word of God says, by your stripes, I am healed. And the word of God says, I came and sent my word and healed their disease. And so because of this, I am in good territory to be in line for healing. And then say, Lord, but I also have faith in you. Because only you can do this magnitude. And so you have to talk to God and let him know. And say, so I now receive my healing. Because that's how God is going to process us in this year. We need to, uh, unless Jesus tarries, we need to get into old age in vigor with a sound mind, able and competent to get up, to do things, cook for ourselves, bath ourselves, take ourselves to church. But listen to Jesus. He goes and looks for this guy and now the reason why he healed him becomes apparent. He says, you, you have been made whole. He says, but remember your lifestyle. He says, accept Christ. Accept Jesus Christ. And repent. And sin no more. Listen. Repentance is a contract and a covenant you make with yourself against something that is not of God that has been in your life. Repentance doesn't mean that you never fall in that area again. But every time you fall in that area, it is by mistake, not by design. And you do not need to be told by anyone that you have done wrong. Pastors and deacons coming and telling you that you mustn't beat your wife up. You have not repented. You should come and say, I lost my cool and shouted expletives at my wife. Then you have repented because you are saying you have a self-regulatory thing that tells you. There are things that we have come to terms with. We cannot cohabitate as Christians. No matter how convenient it is on accommodation, it is not the order and the purpose and the plan of God. You have to get married first before you can have sexual intercourse. That is the word of God. We cannot steal and bribe. We cannot have people under our employ that we do not pay. It is wrong. It is sinful. So you have to go home and write a list of things that you are repenting from. When we say repent, people just think I'm talking about sexual immorality. That must be repented of, yes. But there are many things that we do. Why must we repent? Because if sin is allowed to grow, 
It has a rate of growth that is proportional to the rate of God's intention in your life. And at an opportune time, it will choke the destiny of God. Did you hear what I said? There is God's plan and purpose here. There is the devil's plan and purpose here. If you don't repent and kick this one, it has a knack of growing similarly to what God is doing in your life. And at the time that God would knock on your door that you are ready now to be used or to move into the next level, it comes in and you know the story. You have seen it. You just punch someone and they collapse and they die. And you go to jail. And now the plan, oh no, God wanted me to have a jail ministry. No, my pajar was there. <laughs> it's not you. You have derailed the plan of God by disobedience. So God, repentance is itemizing things that you know are in your life that shouldn't be there, that are contrary to the word of God. And saying God verbalizing, I don't want this, this is wrong, this is sin, I don't want this, I don't want it. Because there are a lot of Christians that are still proud of a sinful trait. Well, people know me. If you cross the line, you, 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 you get it. <laughs> ah, this kind doesn't need prayer. You're, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Well, what do you expect, pastor? My wife is not really competent in these things. That's why I... And you justify. You have not repented. You have not repented. And Jesus says, repent and sin no more. Otherwise, something worse will come. But Acts chapter 3 tells us why we... So re, the, the ultimate repentance is accepting Jesus Christ because that covers the rest. That's the ultimate repentance. If you don't believe on the Son of God, understand that you have made an active decision to go to hell when your life is done. If you refuse to accept Jesus Christ when you have had an opportunity such as we are having today. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 3, and I want to read it. It says, when Peter had healed that man, you remember, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I to thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and started walking. And again, the gosas of the church came and started to find out, what, hey, what's this? It says, and Peter said, hey, hey, guys, don't be shocked and don't act like by some power of our own, this man has been healed. That Jesus that you crucified in his name and the power that he has given us, that this man is walking. And it says they were cut in their hearts, right? They became sad. And Jesus said, and Peter said to them, no, 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 no. Repent. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Please put it up there. It says, repent, therefore. Don't cry about what happened in the past. Don't cry about the things that you have done wrong. Don't cry about the people that you hurt. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That's an incredible word, blotted out. This is what God does. He throws your sins into a sea of forgetfulness. He's not like, 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 like the people that you know. That say, I know, you know, we're good, but you know, when it comes to this, I get a very, I'm just very careful with that guy because in, in, in when we were in high school, God blots out and he says, Though your sins as scarlet be, scarlet is the brightest of red. He says they shall be white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, that's how he has removed our transgressions. And it says that your sins may be blotted out. And so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now understand what is being said here. Peter is saying you are supposed to get into a season 
where God is dealing with you the way that he has always desired to deal with you. What is the way that God has always desired to deal with you? Luke chapter 4. The Bible says that Jesus came back from the wilderness where he had been tempted of the devil. And he came to the synagogue and they gave him the scrolls to read. And as he's launching his ministry, he says the spirit, he opens Isaiah chapter 61 and says, The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Times of refreshing. He has anointed me to heal those who are brokenhearted. Listen, they, it's hard to heal a broken heart because the breaker of the heart usually doesn't have the common sense to come back and say, I'm sorry, to come back and repair the breach, to come back and heal. They walk off and they act like they did nothing. They blame you for what you are going through. So Jesus says that I have been sent to heal the brokenhearted. You know, in medicine, we have what we call first degree burns. If you, if you, if you get water and you're ironing and, and the steam goes on you, especially on the face, everybody is so distressed by that because it's red and so on. But you know, first degree burns of the face heal by themselves. They do. We just come and put cellar, you know, we just act and make you feel the medical aid form. That thing was going to heal by itself. And God has to give us the anointing of wounds that can heal by themselves. Whether she comes back or he comes back to say sorry, it don't matter. First degree heartbreak and it's going to heal by the Holy Spirit and God is going to see. To, you know when they come, the mothers with their little girls, 11 years old burnt. They believe that now they're scar for life. They, I, I, we just laugh because we know that in six weeks you can't even tell which side they were burnt. He has given me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives. Now, captives are in two forms. They are captives who are just sold. Like, like in West Africa, those people that were sold to slavery, they did not want to go. But they were sold. So they had to go. But there are some people who do things that make them captives. When we start with the drug culture, when we start with illicit sex, when we start with violent uh, culture, when we start, they, 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 we become captives, but you walked into it. Jesus didn't qualify. Jesus didn't say to this guy, can you tell me actually the basis of your paralysis? You. He says he has given me to set at liberty the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, people that don't have direction. The entrance of thy word gives light, brings light. I was blind, but now I see. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, who are being taken at advantage of, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Those that have uh, a margin in your Bible. The acceptable year of the Lord is the year of Jubilee. Now, God ordained that Jews would celebrate a Sabbath year every seven years. And then when you had had seven cycles of seven, it became 49 years. In the 50th year was a special year where God restored godly order to the lives of people. That is what was called the time of refreshment. Repent so that the times of refreshing. And Jesus said that I have come to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Because he said to them, that you, this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. I have come. Before that, Jubilee was calendar-based. But now Jubilee for a Christian is obedience-based. If you believe in Jesus and you accept Jesus, if you obey his commandments, then the things, the tenets, the provisions 
of Jubilee where he said broken hearts, captives, physical, emotional, and spiritual will be set free. But let's go to the Old Testament, Leviticus 25. And I want you to write these five things that were the provisions of Jubilee. And I want you to go home and plead with God. That Father, may they manifest in their physical and spiritual connotation. The first one of Jubilee, when that 50th year came, it was mandatory that debts be canceled. Mandatory. You had to let the other one go who owed you. And it was God's way of resetting people financially. It was a financial reboot. Come on, Christians. We, ca we live in Zimbabwe. We know the economy in Zimbabwe. So are you saying some of us that are on the other side of 50, we're just going to be victims of the economy of Zimbabwe when we have a God who is the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills? No, I spoke to you about dunamis last week. And I said, we can change the spiritual atmosphere by our prayer, by our fasting, by our worship, by our belief in God. And it can make it possible for Zimbabweans to, to, to have passage. But if that didn't happen, then God has to create a Goshen around you. Because he says in Malachi... There shall be a book of remembrance opened and I shall make a distinction between those who fear God and those who don't. So God, if he can't do it for the whole mob, your children have to have school fees. You have to have unthreatened accommodation. You have to have food in your house. You have to have working capital and you have to have savings with which you can do the work of God. So he said, set the debts off, right off debt. The second thing is said that ancestral assets or lands had to be restored. Land that was sold by corrupt chiefs, land that was taken in a bad deal, houses that were lost in transactions that went belly up. In the 50th year, they had to be, you had to give it back. And we're sitting here with people that have lost stuff. If you are in Zimbabwe, you know what I'm talking about. You had a business idea that God gave you by now. Where you're supposed to be. It was taken, the bank said, oh, we don't really do greenfield projects. And you don't have collateral security. And so we're either going to do it as a venture capital or... Uh, and then the project died. When the project died, two years later, you saw your very project being implemented by some people. In your jubilee year, God is going to give it back. Because it was yours from him. He says those were the slaves. You had to release slaves. Unless the slave didn't want to be released. I don't want any of us to refuse freedom. If you are a captive, I'm talking particularly particularly people that have habits that have you kept it, that the habit tells you what to do in the morning. The habit threatens you that you know you're waking up, you're praying now, but by this time tomorrow, you will have obeyed me. God can break that. God can break that. And I told you they're captives that were sold into slavery and those that did things that got them into slavery, God is able to deal with. But listen to the final one of Jubilee. God says, you must go back to your family. Leviticus 25, go and read it. You must go back to your family. A struggling brother must get assistance. from You, you know, God, it's not God's design that families be estranged. It's not. We have to get back to talking to our sisters and our brothers. And to our parents. Because there's a reason why God gave you that surname and gave you that bloodline. There's a reason. And we have to. And God would say, come back in the year of Jubilee. And come back together. And I'm praying that God 
would heal some marriages. That God would heal some parents and their children. That God would heal sisters that don't talk, brothers that have had physical fights. That God would heal mothers-in-law and their daughters-in-law. This is the word of God. It says, repent. That your sins may be forgiven and blotted out. And that the Lord would bring in times of refreshing. I pray that God gives each one of us times of refreshing. He says, go and sin no more. And truly repent that God would have his way with us. Let us stand. If you really believe what we're preaching today, the Bible says that immediately this man started to jump up and walked. This week on Tuesday, uh, there was something that we were supposed to be entitled to. And um, we got communication that it was no longer possible. Counting on it. Banking on it. Looking forward to it. Planned with it in mind. And we got a legitimate and reason that we could understand. It wasn't maliciously. It, we fully understood. And I said to my wife, yeah, there it is. But then when I went to brush my teeth, when I was thinking about this message, I said to my wife, it's going to come. It's going to come back. And she said, yes, I believe that. And um, I went to work. So maybe Sunday or whenever the weekend is when we got the news. And this was Tuesday. I went to work. And I sent a message on our family group. And I said, worry is the substitute for for prayer and relationship with God. I said, if you're worried, I was talking mostly to my children, I said, if you're worried, check how your relationship lately is with God. And also check how your prayer life was. It was 8.28 that I sent the message. At 8.30, we got a message that, oh, listen, we've had a reconsideration about that thing. Why am I sharing that with you? There was a word there that said immediately. I want God to give each one of you at least one immediately. Because he's God. So Father, I pray for your children this morning. That the grace of God, the loving kindness of God. The power of the creator of heaven and earth would be felt by each one of these. And Father, that you would cause an intervention, an immediate intervention in their lives that encourages them in their walk with you and that discourages the devil. In Jesus' name.